Hi, everybody, and welcome to MoCo's Most Famous Podcast. My name is Joe Yashiroff. I'm the Director of Content at Montgomery Community Media in Rockville. Today, we are talking to Bruce Murray, one of the greatest soccer players ever in Montgomery County, and also one of the greatest athletes, period, in Montgomery County history. He was a superstar soccer player at Churchill High School in the 80s, won two national club championships while he was in high school, then went on to win two national championships at Clemson, also the Herman Trophy, which is the Heisman Trophy of soccer at Clemson, and became one of the most successful players on the U.S. national team, playing in the 1988 Olympics and the 1990 World Cup. He's in at least three halls of fame. Recently, Murray talked to CBS News and the Washington Post about his struggles with memory loss, dementia, and potentially CTE, which is more commonly attributed to football players. Bruce Murray, thank you very much uh, for talking to us today. Joe, thanks a lot for having me on. Yeah, so I mean, the first question I have to ask you is why, why are you deciding to talk to us and to CBS and the Washington Post? Why did you make that decision and how difficult was that? Well, um, to be honest with you, Lynn and I have gone through a, a very um, long, long searching period of doctors and trying to find out, you know, certain behaviors and, and what is there any impact, you know, did we, you know, we've been told about CT and things like that and impulse control. So we've been through all these doctors for years and years, and we really didn't get anywhere. And we, we finally got involved with uh, the people up at BU and Con Concussion Legacy Foundation. And they actually put us on the right path with Dr. Robert Stern, who's probably the preeminent, uh, you know, brain doctor in, in the United States. And um, we did this interview with CBS two years ago. Um, and we, I don't know if we were 100% ready, uh, but we did because we wanted to, to make it people aware. Um, but now we've come to the conclusion and we did, you know, six months ago when we were going to re-air it. Uh, but things, you know, obviously COVID keeps getting in the way and a lot of things in, in the world are a lot more important or things are important. Um, and so uh, Lynn and I have come, come to the realization that this is our, our life and we need to find a good outcome. And we need to um, maybe make other people aware of potential risks, especially in youth sports. Sure. You know, when you're talking 14 years, 13 year old kids hitting balls, long punts, um, brains that are developing, uh, there is no place for that. I don't care what the rules are. Um, you know, if you had told me that and I knew what was going to happen down the road, I never would have been a part of it. <clears throat> so some people know about this, but not a lot. Heading the ball is a dangerous thing. Maybe not once or twice, but repeatedly, and you, you'll explain it better than I can, but repeatedly heading the ball is like subconcussive hits and the accumulation of that can lead to dementia, CTE, all of that. Is that right? It certainly is. And, and especially I'm at a higher level. And the thing that the, the reason it's dangerous for me is that all the kids that are playing club soccer, they all want to play at a high level. And a lot of them do end up playing at a high level. Not a lot, but you know, people get there. And, uh, you know, when you're when you're heading corner kicks at 80 miles an hour or trying to fight for a ball off a goal kick at you know 70 miles an hour, that's a different different animal. But all those subconcussive hits add up over time. Um, and as you as you go through, uh, you know, all the times we've been up to BU um, and the doctors um, that we've dealt with, um, they explain that to you. And, and we just feel like um, it's our opportunity to reach out to people and let them know that there is real danger here. Um, now, um, is your kid going to get it? Is one professional player going to get it and another doesn't? It, it, it seems to be some type of stealth disease, which nobody really knows who's going to get it and who isn't. And you really can't tell until you, until, you know, death. Um, but they have new ways now of, of scans and the way they do the scans. Um, and I'm going to send you something later to show you that mm -hmm. you know, your listener. Um, uh, where they can actually predict, uh, you know, what CT looks like, even though you haven't passed on. And, and as you just touched on, you, CTE cannot be conclusively diagnosed until someone passes away. Is that, that's correct, right? That's correct. Um, but they're really close and they've got a really good idea when they start doing some of these scans uh, or fluid they take out and they can they can kind of predict, you know, this is what we've seen in a CTE4 or a CTE3 patient. And this is what, you know, this is what you look like. And we can kind of let you know that 
you know, we believe that this is the situation, but they can never, uh, until they get the technology and the research, which costs money, um, we're never going to know. So we need to continue to raise money. Um, for us. Yeah. And so the, the, your brain scan, which we saw uh, in that CBS report, I mean, you don't have to be a doctor to, to see what's going on there. Can you describe what, what we're seeing here in the picture, in the scan? Yeah. Um, so my brain is, is to the left, and that was two years ago. And a normal healthy brain is to the right. And, and the gray matter um, f- should fill in most of the brain. Um, and if you look at my brain, there's clearly a lot of atrophy um, where the brain has, has lost the gray matter. And um, when my wife and I um, saw the side by side, uh, we got a phone call from Dr. Stern and he told us about, about, um, you know, based on what we know and based on what we see, um, you know, you look like you have CTE. Um, And, you know, he explained it. And and again, the CBS picture was very um, startling. When I saw the interview on television, I couldn't believe, you know, I'm looking at my, you know, my brain on TV and I'm looking at a healthy brain and, and, it just, it just hit home. And I think if people see that, they'll understand the situation. A lot of people, um, not a lot of people, very few people, um, there, are, there are people that think they, you know, they write it in and say they know that, you know, um, oh, everyone, you know, heads the ball and not everyone gets it. I mean, um, that, that's correct. But at the end of the day, um, I know what we're, we've been dealing with for a long time. And um, we just need to let people know and, and help, help mm-hmm. people make decisions with, when it comes to their kids. Um, you know, it really is to me, no kid should be a developing brain should not be heading the ball. It's just, there's just too much risk. Yeah. And actually, at least what I've heard and read over the years is the the human brain isn't fully developed until people are 25. So, I mean, 14, it's not even close to being fully developed, but at least it's preventing, you know, some some of the uh, damage that can be done. Right. Is U S soccer, has actually reduced or limited heading in, in younger players. But when it comes to players that are older, the older class of player, uh, there's more research being done. And they, they, they touched on that in the CBS um, interview. And, um, you know, that clearly is something that, uh, that needs to be addressed. Bruce, I'm talking to you. I'm listening to you. I'm, I'm looking at you. Uh, I mean, I can't tell that's any, that there's anything amiss is that one of the things that makes this so, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, but, um, you know, so, so dangerous in a sense that you can't. Count? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I put on a good face and I work hard to, to, but, but just some of the cognitive stuff on a day-to-day basis, um, you know, leaving the car running all the time, um, you know, can't, I mean, I can't get out of the house without finding wallets, keys. And, and again, it's not just dingbat stuff. This is something that it slowly gets, you know, worse and worse and worse. And then, and then there's um, the impulse control issues, you know, um, not, not a massive drink or anything. And, and then, you know, I, I found myself, um, you know, just hold up in a hotel for three or four days drinking, like, you know, just not wanting to be here anymore. And I, I, you know, I, it's ugly, but I have to tell people because it's out there and, you know, no, it, nobody, I mean, a lot of people don't know, but I need to let people know that these are things that you can't control. Um, medication is helping. There's a medication that we take. Um, but, you know, again, um, it, it's like a speeding train, you know, is it going to hit the brakes and slow down or is it going to accelerate and go right off the tracks? I, we don't know. So that, that's, but yeah, to your point, um, you know, if you talk to Taylor Twelman, who's an ESPN reporter, uh, incredibly well-spoken, um, you know, he's been dealing with concussion stuff for a long time. So um, there's a real dark side to it where, you know, people don't see the struggle, the headaches, um, two hours of sleep every night, um, things like that. Uh, you know, the forgetfulness, um, the, the inability to organize or compartmentalize anything. Um, just trying to you know, without, without my wife, uh, you know, who runs this house, like, you know, I'm sure, um, many people have that help, but you know, without, you know, the person paying the bills or getting the tax or just stuff like that. I mean, we, I just, on my own, it would be very difficult because it's, everything's very jumbled in, in my, in my mind. So Bruce, are there good days, bad days, good hours, bad hours? How, how does it typically manifest itself? 
Yeah, there's dark, there's dark, dark, like, um, you know, there's foggy days. Um, there's days that are, you know, incredibly bright. Um, there's day, I mean, the funny part about this is it's a frontal lobe issue. Uh, and they explain that to you. You can remember quite a bit from your past, but you can't remember, you know, things like very, you know, uh, today or yesterday and stuff. And, and there's good days and bad days. Um, and when the bad, you know, in the bad days, um, you know, anger management, um, you know, I, I feel like I was always known on the national team as, as the California East coast guy, <laughs> everyone thought I was from Los Angeles. Cause I, I just, I didn't care about anything. Nothing bothered me. And now, now, you know, little things and, and, and obviously we have young kids. And so you, everyone has young kids. It's everything's a hassle, but I just, I be, um, I have to really check myself to make sure that I don't get angry. And, you know, I, I don't get angry to the point I'm running around like a, a crazy man, but I, I, I'm just not the same guy. And it, it's just, you know, those are things that are hard to explain. Yeah. And this is not, you know, obviously to your listeners, I mean, um, you know, for a guy like, you know, me, I, you're supposed to have it all together. Um, you know, it's hard for me to come out and publicly state all this, but I, I, I think it's my responsibility to do that. At what point, what, was there a moment, was it building for years where you decided, you know what, I'm not going to do this alone privately. I'm, I'm going to come out there and, and share this so I can make a difference. Yeah. When we, when we got involved with BU, uh, we both looked at each other. And we kind of cried because we, we knew that, you know, there's other people involved, uh, people that knew what was happening to us. Um, and she got involved. Lynn did with, um, uh, Mrs. McHale, whose husband died, he was an NFL player. Mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, he, I think he overdosed. Um, you know, um, Scott, you know, Scott Vermillion's a soccer player that, that, that had alcohol, and, and, and all these all these guys seem to overdose. And you know, I, I honestly feel like I'm the luckiest guy ever. Um, you know, if 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 I was a, a you know somebody who was into pain pills or something, I'd be I'd be dead twelve times over. You know, I, I just you know I. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm just lucky. I'm lucky because there's a lot of guys that have gone down this path. Junior say, oh, there's all these people. And when they look at their brain at the end, they understand what was going on. Yeah. Bruce, can you detail just some of these uh, symptoms that, that you've uh, experienced uh, over the last few years? Yeah. So uh, I, I had a concussion. Um, when I was playing and again, that wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a, it, it, it was a, it was a pretty, pretty hard skull to skull hit. And, um, and I was playing in England in, in the English championship league and um, I was not right. And I knew I wasn't right, but I, I wanted to keep my place and all that. And so I, I was, I was um, for weeks, I was trying to kind of hide everything, but I remember um, going to the store and again, I'm in a foreign country. I, I, I forgot where, where I was. I forgot who I was. I forget what I was doing. I went to the store and I didn't realize why I was there. And you didn't have cell phones and everything. So I had to find a bus and I had to call, talk to people to help me get home. Wow. And that was really scary. Um, and so those are the kind of things. Uh, other, other things. Um, now, that meaning, was about 30 years ago? It was about 30 years ago. And I, and, you were and in your 20s. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that was that, those were those were concussion hits. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we don't know what, what happened with with heading the ball. But I, in, in recent times, um, I've left my kids in the car with the car running. And that that scared the hell out of us. Um, obviously, um, you know, we, we things like that. So so, uh, you know, just not being able to to remember certain things, um, you know, very recent things um but being able to remember from a long time ago um you know like uh i've got three things on the agenda and people are like well, where are you what and i'm like oh i forgot right so things like that are not just ditzy moments um right. you know they're 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 definitely uh high impact but but the thing about I, w I remember wandering around the store and this is maybe six weeks later from the concussion and um and i, w I was crying because i, I didn't know where I was, I was in a foreign country and, you know, DC United had a player a couple of years ago named Chris Rolfe. He's a wonderful player, uh, MLS all-star and Chris retired from concussions. And he told the same story about going somewhere and wandering around crying because he didn't know where he was. And I, it was so, uh, it was so 
I, I mean, it was so resonant. I couldn't believe that he was saying because I, the same thing had happened to me. So, can you watch soccer? And if you, if and when you do, can you watch it? I don't know what normally. Yeah, you know, I can I can watch the game, but when when I see anything like the hit the hits, um, part part of the the game has started to legislate out. Um, when when I played the game at that level, um, there was a lot of really hard hits, and and things have just like the NFL. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of um, a lot of uh, soft fouls being called. They're they're trying to slow the game down a little bit, um, but you know when I see a player who clearly is on the floor on his hands and knees and, and he's clearly concussed and he come, you know, they, they get him off the field and he wants to come in and the trainers end up waving him on. And, and, you know, I know it happened in the last world cup. Um, there was a Tottenham player named Bertong and a Belgian guy that, that literally fell down twice in five minutes on the field because he didn't know where he was and he continued to play the game. And, and that was, that was very emotional because um, it's clear down the road, um, you know, based on what I saw that, you know, he's got to deal with some stuff because, um, you know, but the fact that there has to be uh, protocols in place. And, and I know FIFA says in U.S. soccer, you know, we've got protocols in place. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about that. Not, not based on what we see on TV. So what is your what is your hope? What are your goals specifically with whether it's rules changes, a uh, different approach of recognition? Uh, what, what are your goals, Bruce? Besides, yeah, my goal- besides getting better, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, my, my goal is for, for uh, medication, uh, for, for a better, safe outcome for all the, the people that, ha- that deal with CTE. Um, is there a way to speed up uh, the research? Is there a way to get a medication out there? Um, is there some type of operation in the brain? Is there a stem cell type thing? Is there a way we can do that? And then um, that not being a possibility yet, can we can we make it safer for the kids if they learn to head a ball? Can they can they head a volleyball can, in practice? Can they have something that's very light, um, safe heading from a very small distance? And in terms of longer distance, uh, you know, don't don't allow just let the ball hit the ground. Um, again, it's called football all around the world. And if you um, look at you know the game was invented in the 1800s, you know they allowed. Uh, they allowed heading the ball for some reason, but they said, no, you can't handle the ball. So why, you know, if that's the case, then why can't, you know, I know it's almost impossible because, you know, FIFA and all these, you know, huge uh, companies are involved in soccer. But if we reinvented the game today, we could have just said, take heading the ball out. If you look at any other sport, man, you know, if you're playing golf or, you know, and you're at a golf tournament and, you know, the guy, the, the pro hits the ball and everyone's like four and they try and grab their head. Nobody wants to head a ball. I mean, that's, it's, it's almost like um, it's, it's, it's human nature to, to get away from heading a ball. If you talk to pros, they don't want to head the ball. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it, it is, it's a tough, it's a tough business. And um, you know, you had a ball at, at super high, like if you're at my level and you're on a corner kick and you try and run in and head it, but you're dealing with two guys and you got to fight that means that you may have to head it with the side of your head at 80 miles an hour. And it doesn't matter because, you know, that's going to be success for you when that ball goes in the net. Right. So even if you're, you run back and you kind of feel like you're out of it for 10, 20 minutes, uh, or you don't feel right the next day, you know, that's how it, that's how it, it, it is at the national team level. All these guys will head the ball because, you know, and they, and they'll stay on the field because they don't want, they don't want to give up their spot. I mean, if I come off the field, the next guy on the bench, he's in. And uh, at that level, everybody who's playing in the MLS wants to be on that team. They want to be on the flight over to Qatar. So at the end of the day, um, we have to, we have to take out the, you know, the monetary impact or whatever, you know, that you can't get punished for, um, for coming to the staff and saying, Hey, look, I'm, I'm out of it. You can't, I can't play, you know, don't let them make the decision. You make the decision. Bruce, given the, uh, the pain and the suffering that you've endured the last few years, do you still love the game of soccer? Do you have regrets about playing or how you played anything like that? I, I, I love the game. It's a, it's a great game. Um, it taught me so much. It'll, it afforded me so much. I mean, I, I, you know, I got a scholarship. I didn't never pay for school and I, I had a professional career. I made a living, a good one. Um, but, but knowing now what I know, 
it has to change. Um, and, you know, I didn't know those things back then. I don't think a lot of people knew what was going on back then, but it's pretty clear to me now what's happening. And are we slow to change? I think we're slow to change. I mean, soccer is, is you know, it's very slow to change. Uh, look at football. Uh, they realize they have a, 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 a concussion problem and they basically have eliminated the kickoff by pushing the ball up at midfield so the guy can kick it out of the end zone every time. So uh, other other leagues are understanding this. But but again, if, if we can uh, if we can have this generation um, in a better spot in terms of their 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 health, um, you know, it's not going to affect the way they play the game just because, you know, you can head the ball at 14. That doesn't mean anything. I mean, the game's played on the deck for the most part. Let's go back. So, you know, you talked about how your memory, you, you can remember a lot of things about the past. So I want to take, so you're born in Germantown, went to Churchill. What was, uh, what was it like being a soccer player at Churchill where you were probably the, the big man on campus or at least one of the big men on campus, so to speak? What was that like? Well, I, yeah, I, I was, I wasn't really the big man on campus because we had so many good players there. Uh, I didn't get a whole lot of playing time, to be honest with you. I was, I was a really, uh, skinny kid, uh, you know, I was very skillful, but, you know, I always played up two years um, and I always had to fight and battle. And, you know, it was a struggle for me. Um, and then all of a sudden um, I exploded when I got to college, I, I became six foot two mm -hmm. and, you know, the weight room. And next thing you know, um, the game became easy or it was really easy, um, you know, and then obviously, uh, you know, better things happened, uh, after, you know, after college Olympics, world cup, um, playing overseas. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was great, but, um, no, I, I was a struggling soccer player around here. Um, I mean, I, everyone knew who I was, but I was this little skinny kid who had to figure a way out because I didn't have the muscles that some of the other guys had. What, uh, you know, you had a lot of honors, accolades, uh, I talked about it, 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 at least three halls of fame, uh, the Clemson hall of fame, the national soccer hall of fame, and uh, full disclosure, I am I'm part of the uh, Montgomery County Sports Hall of Fame Selection Committee. You're, uh, you're in that one, and you were in the inaugural class in that one with Katie Ledecky, Walter Johnson, Bob Beloy, Dominique Dawes, so some, some uh, you know, big-time names. Um, yeah. What do those honors uh, mean to you now? Well, um, I, I can't even begin to describe how important the Montgomery County Hall of Fame is for me because my parents came here as immigrants, um, you know, Scottish. And, um, you know, they struggled like, like all immigrants do. And they, they, they built this great opportunity for me and my brothers. Um, so for me to be running around the fields of Montgomery County, um, this is where I, it started for me. So, you know, of course, it's important to be in the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame. And it's a rare thing to get there. But, um, Montgomery County Hall of Fame and all the all the guys that I play with, it means just as much to me as as, as any other honor. Um, the is there one goal, one play, one moment that that kind of sticks out? I know you've had a lot. It's like asking a a singer which is your favorite song or your best song, but is there one moment? Maybe it's even the moment where you realize you belong. Uh, you know, is, is there one that kind of sticks out? Yeah, it was. Um, it was like 1985. Um, it was my first game or not my first game, my, my third game for the national team. And I was a really young player. I was still in college and I got picked to go down to Miami and play Uruguay. And the coach told me, listen, man, you're playing a big time team here. You're, you're still a college player. Just, just get the ball, give it to everyone else and don't do anything stupid. And I, I said, okay. And of course I, I stripped a player in my half. And then I beat two players with the ball. I got my head up and then a guy came in and almost ended my career, but I got past him. Um, and I looked up and I said, you know what? I'm going to go for it. <laughs> so I hit, I hit a 37 yard shot probably with my left into the upper corner against Uruguay in, uh, in the old, uh, the old orange bowl. Mm -hmm. And it was full of Uruguayan people who were just, and I totally silenced the crowd and I couldn't believe that I just did what I did and went against the coach. And the coach afterwards told me, um, a guy named Lothar, Lothar Osiander, he's like, 
I was going to kill you, but I kept saying, oh, God, he's going to do it. <laughs> so, so I knew I belonged at that point. I knew I was good enough, um, but there's so much competition at that level. Yeah. Um, you know, there's guys all the time. And, um, you know, to all these guys who are playing in the World Cup, kudos to them because it's so hard. I mean, you, you one minute you're hot, the next minute you're not. You, you're, the, you're the flavor of the month and then you're out. Right. Um, it's, a, it's a grind. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's tough. It's tough. But that's when I, that's when I knew that I had something. I, I just didn't know. I just, I, you know, I knew I wasn't, you know, all that, but you know, it was one of the wonder goals of my career. And it was when I was a young man. It sounds like the old uh, coach saying, don't shoot. And then you make a long shot. Great shot. Don't shoot. Great shot. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. Um, all right, so you're you're still involved in soccer. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you you have over the last few years coached. You've done some TV work. Uh, you have an academy. Are you still doing those things? And uh, you know, how, what does that what does that give you? Yeah. So so we have a, a summer camp here uh, that we do in Bretton Woods in Germantown, and um, it's great. It, working with kids is is fantastic. Um, mostly the kids that come to our camp are World Bank and IMF because it's out at Bretton Woods, which is their, their, um, their country club, I guess. Um, it's, uh, it's got 10 golf and all these things. Um, but um, it, it's just an opportunity to um, allow the kids to get out there, have a good time, play soccer. And a lot of these kids are foreigners and um, they're soccer crazy. And, you know, it's not often that you find like a camp that isn't, you know, our camps are mostly, um, you know, IMF people, we do bring kids in from Bethesda and Potomac and, and wherever, but it's, it's really neat to see these foreign kids and, and the difference in how they treat the game. Right. It's like mm -hmm. so important. And, and they can name every player you know, on Uruguay's team or every player at, at Barcelona, um, you know, where most of us struggle to do that. What is it about Montgomery County that it's always, well, I'll say always for decades, been so soccer uh, rich? Also, uh, uh, whenever you see TV ratings for the big soccer games around the world, whether it's Premier League, World Cup, Washington, D.C. is always up, up, you know, up there in cities that watch most. What, what is it about this county? Uh, melting pot. Um, you know, think, think about, I mean, you know, I live in a neighborhood like everybody in my neighborhood's from somewhere else. I mean, you know. India, Korea, China, uh, Europe. I mean, it's crazy. We have people, you know, and, and I think you just go right through every neighborhood in town and you, and you see that. And we're, a, we're, a, we're obviously the capital of the world with Washington, D.C., um, you know, and it's just a melting pot. Um, and I, I think because of that, um, we just attract so many people from, from different places and, and, and soccer is their passion, you know, and that's the passion. Um, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. You uh, you talked about Montgomery County a little bit earlier when you were talking about the Montgomery County Sports Hall of Fame. So you you were born in Montgomery County. You you were born there. Did you ever leave? And you're still in Montgomery County, correct? Oh yeah, yeah. I live in Potomac. Yeah. So um, so you basically have never left. Maybe a little bit in between. But um, so what is it that you love so much? And maybe you've already said it. What is it so that you you love about Montgomery County and that you've chosen to to be there your whole life? I, because of, of the way I was raised, um, my parents being Scottish immigrants, having to fight for everything. My dad um, became a golf pro or didn't become a golf. He was a golf pro when he came here um, and he got the job at Bretton Woods, which is the IMF. Mm -hmm. And he helped, he helped with the design of the golf course. Mm -hmm. And I, I got to, I learned uh, early on uh how to play golf and I would go out with a Ugandan ambassador and play with a Japanese and it was it, it just um I love the I love the melting pot part of it and just love being around those people so when I played in Europe you know it was great to share like with your you know English guys like about America and they were always asking about America and like I just I just I got a real good upbringing and I grew up you know, around every, I guess diversity is, is the key. Sure. And we are the most diverse uh, place I know. I mean, obviously, you know, there's places like London where I lived and Los Angeles and, and New York City, but man, this place is diverse. It really is. Um, is there someone in your life career, now talking just soccer, 
who you credit the most with the, the player and person that you became or taught you something that was invaluable that you think about to this day? Yeah, my dad, uh, you know, my dad, um, I, I uh, tough to talk about, but my dad, um, you know, being a golf pro, your weekends, you're supposed to give golf lessons. And somehow my dad figured out how to not give golf lessons and take me to soccer. Games. So, you know, uh, I'm sure he, he had to sacrifice a lot to do that. Um, and my dad was smart when, when, when I was 13, I was a little bit mouthy and getting mouthy with my dad. And he brought in uh, a friend of his, a Scottish friend named John Kerr, who was a professional player. His son is the coach at Duke. Mm -hmm. And uh, John became my coach. And it tells you uh, how smart my dad was because he knew that he couldn't do this anymore. He needed to pass me on to somebody else. And, and it was great. It was great. But my father is, uh, is no question um, the reason. Um, he would actually take me down to the soccer field with a bag of balls and drop me off and say, I'll see you in six hours, right? If you want to do this, then, then do that. So I didn't have guys to play with or cones to run around. I, I would, and I would perfect free kicks and I would per perfect passing and things like that. And, you know, it, it was just, um, it's almost like Kobe Bryant when he talks about, you know, just going and taking a thousand jump shots, right? Um, the same idea, right? You, you either have it or you don't, um, you know, and, and um, I never once, you know, felt like I was burned out of the game. I just always loved playing. So. It sounds like also Malcolm Gladwell, the 10,000 hours you put in all that time and repetition, you're, you're going to get better. Uh, if no you, question. If you do it the right way. Which is, which is why um, I always like to teach kids real quick is, is, uh, is everything we do, do it with two feet because, at some point, you don't even realize it, but you're going to be good or proficient with both feet and you'll be equally proficient. So, you know, when I was a professional, um, I could shoot the same. didn't matter which foot. I mean, I could pass with, you know, it was so I mean, it, it is it is like you said, um, you know, if you if you keep doing the same thing and don't realize it, um, you know, and that's the mark of a great coach. A lot of coaches will just, you know, like, ah, let's play to the strength and this and that. But mm -hmm. that, that's. That's just for the coach's success. If you want the kid's success, you got to play to his strength. You just gave some advice, but what advice would you give in general to kids or parents of kids right now, knowing what you know, having the career that you did, but everything else that comes with it, what advice would, would you give them right now? Um, it's a really hard business. Uh, it, it's, um, it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of rejection. I mean, it's not always, it's not always positive. Um, but uh, I, would, I would give that parent the advice of provide the resource, all right? Can you provide the resources, no matter what it is, a small amount, a, a bigger amount? If you can provide the resources, step back and let him grow. A lot of, a lot of parents don't quite take that advice and they, they, they get too involved. And unfortunately, um, college coaches, scholarships, they, they, they don't care. The parents don't matter to them. They, they, it's the kid. So, um, the parents would just step away, give them the resources, send them to the right camp, whatever it is, uh, get the right trainer, but just step away, let the kid grow up on his own. And, and they'll be, they'll be, they'll either make it or they won't. They'll decide if they want to be a player or they won't be a player. Cause it, it'll be a really tough grind. It's not, it's not easy. All right. So back to you and, and what you're dealing with, um, Let's kind of talk about, again, what, what, how can we, you know, doing this interview here, what, what can we do, what, what can we do to, to get the word out besides interviews like this to, uh, to make people more aware? I appreciate that, Joe. Um, just just um, understand that um, there, there's a whole kind of generation of players uh, that are coming through, um, and, and some of them are having symptoms. I, I had a number of professional players – that people know names. I won't name the names who texted me today who are worried uh, and they play locally uh, on the local team that we all know. So, mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, I, I would just say um, pray or think about um, a good outcome for, for uh, all the players that are affected by this and see if, if, if we can support, uh, you know, foundations like the CLF, 
Concussion Legacy Foundation, which is up in, in Boston, and um, they're doing groundbreaking research, um, Chris Nowinski and his team, mm-hmm. um, with NFL players, soccer players, you know, uh, they've been over to England to work with their soccer players. So, yeah, I, I, would, I would just ask people to get, you know, get this into their, into their radar and just know that it's out there, especially those, those, you know, there's 13 million youth kids playing soccer in this country. Um, there's something going on. It's, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's something that needs to be addressed and, you know, we need to, to be aware of it. And, you know, I, I'm in a different situation. I, I don't think um, every player is going to be where I'm at, but I, I hope that, um, you know, even if one player gets help from, from watching this or one parent, then I feel like I've done my job. Absolutely. Uh, Bruce, I uh, can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, your, your courage and bravery are obvious in, in what you're doing. And um, I know it's not easy to talk about this and, and hopefully interviews like this will help get the word out, as you said. Uh, wishing you, uh, your wife, Lynn, and your family the best. Um, and again, thank you so much for, uh, for talking to us today, Bruce. Joe, thank you very much. And, and thank you. We love you, Montgomery County. Thank you. And your dog loves Montgomery County too. And thank everybody for watching. Uh, Have a great day, everybody. And we'll see you next time on MoCo's Most Famous.